In actual fact, there were three orders given for the charge of the Light Brigade. First was a, a preparatory order uh, asking the Light Brigade to move into a certain position to recapture some guns that were in, on a height. The second order um, uh, uh, told them to go ahead and try and capture the guns and, and bring them back. And the third order was in exasperation because nothing had happened after the issue of the first order, the second order, and it simply said, charge the guns and, and um, get them. And of course, the fellow that took the order down from Ragnon, who was way up high on a, on a, on a cliff, uh, and who could see what was going on, the chap uh, who took the order down um, had some rather uh, fancy notions about what cavalry could do and should do, and he gave them, he gave the, uh, the commander of the Light Brigade, Lord Cardigan, the wrong, the, the wrong direction to yeah. go in, yeah. and of course they went yeah. to charge. In other words, what they wanted Cardigan was go up the hill and protect the British guns or, or none, uh, that had yeah. just been captured by the Russians, and he went right down the valley, right into the mouth of the Russian That's right. guns. Yeah. Yes, yes. Actually, you know, the casualties from that charge weren't as heavy as, as um, they were acceptable. Yeah. But they, it really goes down to one of the, uh, a Frenchman who was watching it, he said, uh, uh, say magnifique. Yeah. You know, in other words, it's magnificent, but it isn't war. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, Airy got tremendous criticism for this, although so he had nothing to do. Yeah, so, so eventually he got back to Britain. That's right. Yeah. He, he eventually went back to England, and uh, he was the governor of Gibraltar, yeah. and uh, ended up as a, a full general in the British Army, and had a very, a very distinguished army yeah. career. And of course, he sold off through Beecher, a London lawyer who was his agent, all yeah. the property he owned yes. in Elgin County. That's right. Mrs. Now, John, Beecher I think is, uh, well, the Beecher House is still in London. Yeah, it's on uh, uh, Rideout Street. Is I it? think it is. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, so he sold it first. You know who he sold it first to? Well, uh, Airy, he, Airy inherited the Talbot, the Port Talbot yeah. estate yeah. property, which was approximately 1,500 acres at the yeah. time. And uh, of course, the, the interesting uh, differences between Airy and Colonel Talbot's manservant, a companion, George Macbeth uh, mm. is is a, sort of a dramatic chapter in the in the final dissolution yeah. of this property. But Airy actually received the property yeah. and held it until 1869, and yeah. it was sold at that yeah. time to the Macbeth family. And the Macbeth family owned it until 1925, when it was yeah. bought by some Americans. Yeah. See, uh, this George Macbeth you married became the sort of uh, general factotum to Talbot. And Talbot left him all the property he had left. That's right. He, and, uh, he about half of his inheritance yeah. went to the Macbeth. And then he di Talbot died in 1853 at the age of 82, and Macbeth inherited it. Then he must have sold land to raise the money to buy the Talbot estate in 1869. Eh? I would think so. Yeah. yeah. So the Macbeths did all right out of that. Yeah, they did. Uh, th you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, George Macbeth, sort of. Um, cozying up to yeah. Colonel Talbot, but I, I don't know. No. I, it, it's, it's an easy thing to say about someone, yes. but yeah. I think Macbeth really did look after poor old oh, Colonel Talbot I think in he his did. old age, and I don't think Harry yeah. was terribly no. interested in looking after him. No, no. I, uh, I think Harry was pretty yeah. disgruntled all his life about yeah. that. Well then, uh, what, we want, what I want to get to is that the Talbot estate then is in private hands in 1869 and remained in private hands until uh, your family came to the seat. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of the uh, Talbot estate the way it is now. Yes. Now when did your family... Well, um, we bought it in 1954. Uh, my father um, was retiring from the newspaper business at the time. And I had just come back from uh, service in the Navy in Korea and decided that I wanted to uh, do something else. And um, this property was on the market. And uh, we had always lived in the country. And he was anxious to get out in the country. And so was I, because I'd been living in very confined quarters for <laughs> 10 years. Um, and so we decided that we would uh, take a crack at, uh, at Port Talbot. And so we came up here. I came up here on the 13th of June, 18, 1954, and, um, and started things rolling. 
at that time. It had been owned by a group of Americans before that, uh, known as the Seniors Corporation of Detroit, Michigan, or Wayne County, Michigan. And um, they had bought it at the time of Prohibition and wanted to turn it into a country club, um, rather along the line of the Seniory Club in, in, at Montebello. Um, and they sold shares in it, and people, even in 1954, kept rolling up and showing these shares of this company that they, that they thought they owned this, the, the land. I said, no, I'm sorry, you don't own the land. But um, we bought it in, in 1954 and started to work on fixing up the farm, fixing up the house, and getting the property into, into uh, proper shape for, for farming and for living. And that's about uh, what has happened to it. Um, since since our since yeah. our tenure began. Well, then when did your father die? He died in 1977. Yeah. And he lived in Colonel Talbot's house. I lived there for a short time before I was married, um, and then I moved into another house and fixed it up. Um, uh, but he lived there for the last um, oh I would think 10 years of his life. Um, that was his permanent residence. And uh, when he died in 1977. The house fell vacant, and um, um, it, it, it was used uh, by other members of the family for some time as a summer house. But um, it's never really been uh, put to proper use uh, since that time as a residence. Well, John, it's, it's our most historic house, really, in the county. And uh, your family has been, and you especially, have been really very, very generous about letting tours of high school kids go out there and interested groups go out there. And uh, uh, what do you see as a solution to the problem of the house? I mean, as it is now, you're a private uh, taxpayer. You have to pay all expenses of upkeep and everything else, and uh, people expect you to see it. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, it's a difficult question because, of course, we we uh, enjoy the ownership of the property, but uh, uh, the expenses involved in keeping that particular house going mm -hmm. are are uh, rather high. And um, I have suggested to the rest of my family, and uh, they're very widely spread now. I have uh, two sisters and a brother, and. Um, uh, they live a long way away from here, and they're they're not too interested in the place. So, there has been the suggestion that it it should be uh, sold or turned over to um, a conservation authority or otherwise disposed of. Um, and this summer, we did have uh, we set the house up rather as a, a museum, or not as a museum, but as a as a heritage house, and uh, with all the um, various um, uh, items of furniture in it, which went back to Colonel Talbot's day. A lot of the stuff, uh, a lot of the furniture in the house is our own furniture. But it fitted pretty well because it's uh, a lot of early, early Canadian um, uh, furniture and paintings and that sort of thing. So we had uh, a two-week period in August when we allowed the public to come in. Um, they were charged uh, $2.50 a head to cover the costs of it. Um, and um, uh, no one seemed to mind paying that. And it was certainly in a good cause, because um, we, we were able to fix up the house uh, from the proceeds, or at least do part of that, at least contributed to fixing it up. And if the house could be established on some kind of footing like that, um, we would gradually withdraw from it and, um, and have uh, what other, whatever heritage group or conservation group uh, uh, that we might find responsible uh, to take it over and to take over the, um, the land. Um, that's what I would like to see happen. Whether it'll happen that way, I don't know. Um, a, a private investor may come along and decide mm -hmm. that, that he or she wants to. Well, take if it a private over. investor does come along, I understand you do have a price on it. Oh, yes. yeah. And uh, if a private investor comes along and buys it, then. Uh, yes, yeah, so, well, they're, 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 we haven't. Um, we have uh, discussed it with the provincial government, and uh, the, the provincial government has not made any indication that. Uh, that it can do no, anything no. about it. It would have to be done through some sort of um, 
a trust yeah. or um, a conservation authority. It's too bad that we don't have what they have in England, the National Trust, yeah. which is a um, well well found um, a trust organization drawing its funds from from many sources and restoring and keeping uh, in in being these uh, marvelous old houses in England uh, that are part of that the heritage of that country and to a large measure have have been instrumental in in saving uh, uh, Britain a lot of uh, foreign exchange uh, by attracting tourists to the country. Um, so that that uh, is really probably the way yeah. a place like that should go. Yeah, we're we're a funny country. We have no setup for that. We like people to be able to go to uh, historic places as long as somebody else is paying for it, and we really have no provision for uh, looking after things. Uh, uh, and uh, this is what's happened to the estate from the time that uh, uh, it was turned over to Harry, and Harry sold it to the Macbeths, and uh, so on. You know. Maybe we should just look at a few pictures of the house as it is now. All right. And um, um, there's a. We only have a few minutes, John. Oh, I all think right. we're going to have to. Right. Uh, well, um, here's a picture of the house uh, taken in the spring of this year, and it shows it as it is today. Um, there's some nice tulips out in front, and it's uh, it's an early time of the year. Um, a little crooked. Oh, that's all right. That is really much the same as Airy designed it, isn't it? It's it's the 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 feeling is the same. It yeah. it, it hasn't come out quite the same way. Um, the entrance is 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 new. I think uh, Fred Green designed the entrance. Oh, yeah. so, um, mm -hmm. And it fits into rather the pattern of the Elgin County Pioneer Museum mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And it it really um, it makes the house quite attractive. Yeah. Um, it, it looks from the outside to be quite small, but in fact, when you get inside, it's, it's, a, it's a very large house. The ceilings, this is, the ceilings are 14 feet high, and um, the living room, I think, measures 20 by 26, um, and has been described as a, as a perfectly proportioned Georgian room, the, the house might be called uh, Greek Revival or Neoclassical or mm -hmm. uh, with a, 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 a Georgian flavor to it, um, a colonial Georgian flavor. Uh, this is the, uh, the living room and uh, the entrance hall is, um, uh, has a stairway leading up into the, into the attic and uh, has various pictures in it and uh, maps and, and uh, other documents. So it's, it's uh, the, the tour that we had went through all the rooms and explained the rooms as, as the tour group went through. And I think people generally found it uh, a quite uh, a, a worthwhile experience. What I really uh, would, would hate to see done is to have the thing commercialized with a popcorn and that sort of thing. It, it should really remain simple and uh, and that serene atmosphere, and you can go out to the cliffs and see over Lake Erie, and it, it, it just, it's a soul restorer. Yeah, uh, to, no, no, I know, it's a, a, a beautiful place, and uh, you have been having some tours of high school students that you set up this fall. Yes, we've had uh, students out, and um, the program, the local history program in the, uh, in the public schools uh, in grade eight, uh, fits into a, uh, into this, and it certainly, I think, gives the students uh, um, a feel for the for what they're reading in the yeah. books. It, it's it, uh, and they'll remember that. Well, I, uh, all I know, a great number of Elgin County students and Elgin County residents have uh, been through this historic house, but it's really because of the generosity of uh, Mr. John Carr. Uh, who has always been interested in making the house available. And I hope, John, that you don't sell the property. I, I do hope that uh, something will turn up by which uh, the historical part of that, uh, like the house, can be preserved. And I'd like to thank you very much for coming today and uh, talking to us about the very interesting history of the Talbot Settlement and the Malahide Farm. And thank you very much for listening.